I'm uh, from working at the University of Kentucky, and I'm a PhD candidate, and my um, system is dealing with bacterial wilt, which is Erwinia trachophila in musk melons. Erwinia trachophila or bacterial wilt is found uh, all over the world. Uh, not so much in the drier climate here, but mostly in uh, the wetter, more humid, but as recently found in New Mexico too, which is kind of unusual, but let's see. So if you're not familiar with it, um, what happens with uh, bacterial wilt is it kills the plant and in about two to three weeks. So um, let's see, so what we'll go through here. Uh, or Winnie trichophila, that's uh, bacterial wilt and cucurbits. It's, I was using organically produced uh, Athena cantaloupe, which is the main cantaloupe in this country, the uh, conventionally grown cantaloupe. Uh, we use row covers to exclude the vector, which the main vector is striped cucumber beetles, cucumber beetles. And another aspect of the work will be with blight band, which is a connection to the previous research that we talked about earlier. So what happens? is our little vector over here, the striped cucumber beetle. It, um, it has the bacteria inside. It overwinters with the bacteria. It may pick it up from uh, plant hosts uh, in, the, um, in the weeds. There are Johnson grass. There's other grasses that it uh, may pick it up from. Some of the conventional wisdom is that it uh, overwinters in its gut. And so in the springtime, it comes out and starts feeding on uh, leaves, stems, uh, different places on the uh, melons, cucurbits of different kinds. And what happens is it passes the bacteria out of its mouth into the plant and also it's through its frass. So if it's really there long enough, it, it leaves um, some presence on the, the leaf and on the uh, stem and by uh, moisture the bacteria will migrate into the plant so um, and then what happens is the bacteria multiplies in the xylem and it gets to a point where it plugs up the vascular system and the plant wilts as you saw in this this is and it can happen within two to three weeks so you can imagine if it takes three months uh, approximately for a, cucumber, a, a, a melon plant to go from a, a seedling that's been transplanted to harvest, there's plenty of time for this bacteria to be uh, infected in the plant and the plant to die. One of the, the common frustrations in Kentucky is the um, plant will look wonderful all the way up until the cantaloupe is netting, it's still green, but then suddenly the whole plant dies and the plant, the cantaloupe is worthless. It's not marketable and they can lose, but statistically say they can lose up to 70% of the crop, which is pretty devastating. But then other years, it may not be a problem at all. So it's really hard for a grower to predict from year to year whether this is going to be a viable crop or it's an experiment. So let's move on. So here, these are row covers. It's, um, and you know, you hoop. They put hoops over the crop, you put the row covers on, you bury them, and this it effect, effectively excludes the vector. But then, how do you pollinate? And so you typically just take the, um, the row cover off, and what happens? The vector can get in there. He has up to, uh, let's see, six to eight weeks before harvest. So what can happen? That's, that's a, a vulnerability time. So... Um, we can look at the harvest data from the first uh, one year, and you can see here, uh, let's see, I guess this, this little, point, yeah. Okay, so here, these are different uh, things we tried. Here's bumblebees under the row covers to uh, see if they would pollinate. They didn't do too well. Here's untreated at all, so the, uh, the vector had a field day on those. And here is uh, row covers up until anthesis, and then uh, off, so you're using contact um, uh, contact pesticides, uh, OMRI approved pesticides to try to control them, knock down the numbers, and then recovering after after two weeks, re putting the remay back on top. But this is our the innovation from a typical 
treatment that was a part of my research. And then here's another, a different alternative is to keep the row covers on, but opening up the ends of the tunnels to allow uh, pollinators to get underneath and pollinate during that time. And it seems that they're, they're fairly similar in result. However, the, uh, my co-researchers uh, felt that it may be an artifact of short um, rows rather than actually uh, something that a commercial farmer might experience with much longer rows. So then, so you can see uh, the point I wanted to make here is that this, you can see that there's a significant difference between a more traditional organic approach, which is up here about 120 pounds and then a um, untreated, what the vector can do to it. So then here's a, another year where I have included a, a typical organic production. Uh, you can see how, how, what it came out to. The untreated, look, this one's a great year. Hardly, you know, not much damage at all. So the farmer's really happy that year. But, you know, the previous year he lost his crop. So here is a, a different test trying to figure out, well, if um, we can handle this uh, row covers off for a few weeks and then recovering, how many weeks does it need to get uh, is sufficient to get uh, close to a typical. And we found that one week is, is not enough, but two weeks was, was uh, very good. So that, that looks like it's um, a good modification to the system. As it may be, there's what's the advantage here is you have a lot less pesticide use um, after uh, anthesis. And your crop, and, and besides the fact that you're using contact through contact pesticides throughout the season, you're only killing the bugs that are there when you spray and you're reducing the numbers. But if you get more vectors blown in and during the week that you're not spraying, they can infect again. So it's, they're, they're, it's kind of touch and go. So you have to consider, well, how effective is this going to be? So in, the, um, in my research, as, as I was continuing my research, I thought, how can you protect the plants it, during that two week window? Is there something you can do to enhance the protection that's currently not done and is available on the market today? So I can, uh, let's see here, here, here it is. I, the row covers excluded in, uh, until anthesis. And then there's vulnerability during the two week window and uh, the row covers reapplied, uh, reapplied until harvest. Okay, so then I, what I said, had a class in um, vector uh, interactions with plants and the idea of is there something you can add that will uh, enhance the plant health and uh, I test a whole bunch of uh, organic compounds and some of them had some success some some didn't but then the one that had the most effect was a product that's already on the market for Erwinia amlivora which is what uh, we were talking about previously, fire blight. And what I, I found, because Erwinia trachophila, which is, is bacterial wilt, and Erwinia amylivora are closely related uh, bacteria, I thought, well, perhaps, and they also have a similar kind of action in the plant, is maybe this would possibly have some benefit in my plant system. So. Uh, blight ban A506 is, uh, was previously researched in, at Cornell and also um, uh, Dr. Stockwell at um, uh, Oregon State University is continuing that work. And it's an OMRI certified application for frost temperature suppression as well as uh, Erwinia amylivora. And um, what's interesting for this system is that it's assumed or at least it's research to believe to be only a suppression of the bacteria in the fruit nectaries. It doesn't there. It's not recorded as having any other effect besides kind of a surface application and uh, what they call um, competition for nutrients in the nectaries. So it suppresses by starving the other bacteria. So, um, but I found something a little bit different. So here, this is um, a control plant that's that uh, didn't have any treatments, and uh, so it's growing happily. And these had Arwenia trachophila added to them. And so here's the uh, a, the dead plants after two weeks. 
This one had blight ban uh, uh, 1x or what I call, it's the highest level that's re recommended on uh, uh, blight ban, although it is not uh, rated for my use. I, as a, a researcher, I can try it on different things. And so I tried it on my melons. So this is 1x and this is 4x. So what happens, I've typically found in the lab is that when you inoculate in the plant in here, up, at, up near the beginning, a few of the leaves in, the, are, uh, in that area die off, but then it'll, uh, the rest of the plant continues to grow with flowers and normally you know, just growing out. So it would appear that there's some kind, something happening to limit the bacteria's ability to continue affecting the rest of the plant. It doesn't uh, strangle the plant and it doesn't die. And I saw this over and over in the laboratory. So, um, so uh, I did. We did do one um, field trial, and um, since we had relatively low uh, insect pressure, I can't say that it um, was a really good test that year. However, there wasn't any phytotoxicity. We had the plants grew just fine. There wasn't any um, real application problem. So I had to. Mo I moved on to what's the mode of action? What's causing this to happen? And what I had a, a, did a, a growth chamber test where we looked at um, untreated plants, uh, were sampled, and also blight ban one x treated plants, and uh, in these durations. And what I found when you're looking at the um, PR one, which is a commonly recognized as a plant defense um, gene. And when you're seeing responses in that, you're uh, identifying uh, the plant is upregulating plant defense genes to defend itself. So here we're seeing between uh, the first day, the, the in, in one hour after, well, let's put it this way. The uh, blight ban was put on uh, approximately two days prior. And then uh, on the day of, um, inoculation of the bacteria uh, one hour after inoculation we take samples and it shows that within that hour from a untreated to a treated there's a one fold increase of the pr1 gene and then also so two days later as a sample taken two days later we also see a one fold increase in the pr gene from the original and also up here from the treated versus the uh, untreated, a th a almost fourfold increase, and also a fourfold increase from the treated the second day of the treated one hour. So this is different from the uh, Erwinia amylivora um, mode of action, which is recognized more of a surface treatment, to actually a uh, systemic response going on in the plant. So in, in conclusion, uh, we see that the, uh, uh, by covering the, um, the, the uh, melons after anthesis till the end of the till harvesting, we're reducing exposure to vector, we're reducing chemical application and costs, and by the application of the blight ban, it appears to be in, uh, triggering a plant defense response. So it kind of helps cover the entire period of uh, the plant cycle when it could be expo exposed to the vector from Erwinia trachophila. Uh, I acknowledge lots of people. Uh, it was actually, um, I first started out with a, um, a Kentucky, uh, Kentucky New Crops um, grant, and then it moved on to an OREI grant with uh, Iowa State University, um, University of Kentucky and Penn State. and. Um, See, and that's it.